Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Now, let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. Family trauma has a wide variety of situations that can create a trigger for many families, from neglect, witnessing domestic violence, life-threatening accidents, and so much more. One aspect of trauma amongst family that may not be as commonly known, but still a huge cause of family trauma, is the emotional aftermath of natural disasters that can bring about some emotional triggers for family members. To guide us through our own understanding of the emotional aftermath of a natural disaster is Michael Riley. To give a little background of Michael, he is a certified counselor, an accredited family dispute resolution practitioner, as well as being a family and couples therapist and coach. Thank you for joining me on the show, Michael. Thank you, Dana. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's amazing. I love the background that we're that we're working that you're working from today, and it definitely is showing that it happened. Anything can happen at any moment where you're guided to a job, where anything, any circumstance can take place. Absolutely, yeah. I was saying to you earlier that we sometimes have to improvise, and today is one of those circumstances. Um, needing to meet with a family after our session, and um, and just finding a, a park that's quiet and and um, suitable and so uh, enjoying the sunshine as well yes no definitely i'm i was telling him behind the scenes that i feel very jealous seeing the sunlight (laughs) and sunshine from his side um it's so dreary and gloomy here in melbourne so it is it is nice to see that sun still exists absolutely so how often do you handle cases that involve a collective emotional trauma amongst family members I suppose the short answer would be nearly every circumstance where we meet with a family or a couple, there's going to be some level of trauma. Um, I, I think the definition of trauma is very is very broad these days, and um, and so w- we understand that when we talk to people, that whether it be in their childhood experiences or whether it be uh, developmentally through their teenage years, or even as an adult, that they've experienced some circumstance where they've had trauma uh, exposure. So from a trauma-informed perspective, we generally are coming into any client interaction with a presumption that there would be some level of trauma that a person is dealing with in the background. There's an old saying that often when we hear the issues that are presented from clients and we ask them what the issues are and what the problems are, uh, that usually the problem that they state isn't the problem. The problem is just uh, a a behavior or a symptom of a bigger problem. And that's often associated with the trauma that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. And how did you get to being in the field of study? I mean, what was the spark that gave you an interest in handling cases that involve so much emotional strength? I've always loved working with people. Um, I, I was saying earlier to you as well that I was a state training manager for a large uh, logistics company many years ago. And even in that space, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to train in a whole range of areas, whether it be I was a first aid trainer for a little while, and um, we also did a lot of um, public speaking training and then uh, customer service sales training. But all of those sort of fields uh, did help me to appreciate that I love working in the development field and helping people to tap into uh, their strengths 
and to identify not only to identify them but also to enhance them. So that then led into some opportunities where I was able to work with corrections, New South Wales corrections, and um, and work in a therapeutic community environment with young offenders. Uh, so it was eighteen to twenty four year olds, a, a group of men that we would see um, uh, every week, and it was quite it was quite a unique. It was the only one in Australia. It was uh, it was called the Intensive Learning Centre, based out at uh, the John Moroney Centre at uh, Windsor, and basically uh, we were doing sort of psychoeducational type work with uh, the boys or young men. Uh, but then that also led into other opportunities within corrections and also outside of corrections where I was able to delve more into the counselling, therapeutic aspects of, of helping people. Mm-hmm. Well, it's really interesting uh, how like a passion for it led into such a career, such a diverse career in the amount of professions that you seems to be doing as well there's amount of things like i think i just listed a few of them but there's so many more that you um go through and that you talk about as well um before we get started we love to start with little get to know you um and play a little icebreaker that just before just to get to know you a little bit more personally so the first one is what kind what book would you recommend to our audience today Oh, there's so many, but I, I, just off the top of my head would be uh, The Last Speech. And I can't even remember the author, but essentially it was about a university lecturer who um, was diagnosed with cancer, pancreatic cancer, I think it was, and uh, his journey uh, in the last 12 months of his life and what he was able to do with his remaining time on the earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was it, very, very touching. Um, but yeah, it's just a book that's always sat very strongly with me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's it's amazing how books resonate with so um, many different people. I think it's it's so different to how a movie would, for example. Like just with the written word, it's it's super important to you can still find some kind of inspiration from it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, the next one is a movie that you absolutely love. Um, well, one that I've seen, one that I've seen, uh, I think it was last year, it was called The Dawn Wall. I don't know whether it's a, mm-hmm. it was a documentary, a film, and essentially it was uh, about um, a young fellow uh, in his climbing expedition on. Um, a very known, a well-known um, challenge in the United States, um, and the the reason why I loved the movie was because it wasn't really just about rock climbing uh, and the adventurous aspect, which there was definitely a large part of that, but it was also about his journey um, in and his friendship with with the person that he was doing the climb with. I don't mm-hmm. want to give too much away, um, but but it's 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 fascinating just to see what human beings can do when they're pushed, but also the sacrifices that people make. Uh, and in this particular movie, that's what I uh, it really surprised me um, what this young fellow was able to do from a personal accomplishment point of view, but more in the sense of um, giving or risking doing something that he was so determined to achieve uh, in favour of his friendship. Um, Yeah, and again, I won't go into the detail, but it was just amazing, Mm -hmm. an inspiring movie on that level. No, that sounds like an incredible movie. I love where even though it has a main topic, it it still dives deeper into it rather than just, it's not just about climbing, it's about how a person's perception in things is very important. So yeah. th- that is incredible when movies are able to do that. Yeah. So the next one is a podcast that you find interesting. I'm not a big podcaster, and I know I'm on a podcast to <laughs> speak, uh, but one podcast that I did get hooked on a few years ago, and I, and I occasionally still listen, is the ABC Conversations. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. They, they were just, I mean, I'm sure you've probably listened to some of them. Um, the, the interviewing style um, and the range of, of people that were being interviewed uh, was just amazing. So, yes, yeah. no, I, I love the conversation. Um, my friend actually works, works there currently. So she oh. works for the social media part for it. And she got me absolutely hooked on it now. So I am constantly listening. It's probably the only, I'm not, I was never a big podcaster. I will admit um, until I started working in podcasting. Yeah. Um, but now it's probably the one main one that I love listening to. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure being a, a very novelist uh, podcaster. Yeah. Great yes, to hear. Yes, no, yeah, no, it's amazing. It's amazing how much you learn from a podcast sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is a famous role model of yours. It, it, it would be, I mean, there's all, you know, the, the, the different leaders that we know uh, that obviously have some level of impact, but I, I tend to not think of them as role models, mainly because I'm only seeing a very small portion of who that person is. Mm -hmm. So when I think of a role model, um, I, I, obviously my wife um, is is someone who her generosity, her humility, um, and her kindness is is. Uh, are probably the qualities that really stand out for me that have influenced and impacted me and shaped me to be a better man um, with a, a lot more still to to develop. Um, but Sonia, definitely, uh, we've been married for 35 years now. So yeah, definitely Sonia's patience, um, resilience with with our relationship. And, and then there's other people, of course, in my family. My, my two sisters are, are beautiful people that have had a, a big influence on me. Then my brothers. Um, and, but outside of that, uh, obviously there's different colleagues, but there's too many to mention. One person, though, that I have found instrumental um, is Noam Chomsky. Um, so he's, a, uh, he, he's quite prolific in in challenging the narrative from media and uh, very intelligent in the sense of understanding the political dimensions that are occurring around the world. Um, he, he's quite of age now, uh, but, but um, his influence on helping me to understand the impact of media, uh, and this was even prior to the impact of social media on society, but just how influential and how manipulated media is and and the impact that it has on society. So it, it's helped me to be cautious uh, and careful about um, listening to you know a story just from one angle and always realizing that there's another side. Yeah, yeah, I think because um, I study media currently and I'm doing my master's in it at the moment and the amount of times that they tell you don't trust anything that people tell you don't trust anything that the news says because there's so much of it's more of a news has an opinion on things right. but not really a lot of the facts majority of the time so I'm very much a I think especially in the last couple of years I've very much learned to find multiple sources for every situation so yes yeah, that is one big piece of advice that I've learned to rely on heavily. <laughs> uh, the last one is a course that you've completed that has inspired your career today. Uh, there's been, uh, again, there's been quite a few. One, well, if I could mention two, uh, <laughs> one was a... Um, essentially a creative group work type program, but it was um, it was a longer program where we were able to um, stay in a group um, for about 12 months. We would meet periodically through the year and there were certain activities that we would do, but 
it gave us the opportunity to uh, be participants in a group. So a lot of the work that I have done over the years and I still love to do in the psychoeducational space is group work. So this particular program really helped um, me to experience group work as a participant, even though it was an actual training program. And um, and just see it from a client's perspective and and also just learn from the other participants who are in the group. And the facili- or the two facilitators that were running the program, Leslie and Kevin, um, are beautiful people, uh, very humble people, but also very skilled. And they really enhanced my appreciation of group work. And And then just recently, I completed a behavioral addictions program uh, that um, was fascinating just to see the influence of, of um, even with the DSM and the diagnostic side of things, how that's being shaped and been changing based on a lot of behavioral developments that are occurring in society. Uh, one in particular was uh, that fascinated me was uh, um, virtual autism. And just how how that issue in society is dramatically uh, in, increasing. Um, the one of the lecturers mentioned that in the nineteen seventies that autism uh, was occurring in one in fifty uh, one in five thousand children, whereas now it's occurring in one in fifty two. Wow. And with, yeah, and it was it was without going into all the detail, but just seeing the influence essentially of media media um, options, whether it be you know screen, it's essentially screen time, and just how that has shaped and influenced uh, this development of virtual autism in children, uh, both from from an age of two up to around ten, uh, and it's primarily because of uh, screen time being used as a babysitter and the amount of time that children are in front of a screen and the impact that that's having on their inability to um, pick up on social cues and emotional cues um, that then are exacerbated and uh, eventually diagnosed into a, a form of autism. Wow, it's amazing that connection between the amount of study that must have gone into that to be able to figure to find that set of evidence is would be incredible to see yes so today we're talking about family and the family trauma that comes in a natural disaster um i know that everyone has a very diverse uh definition as to what family is what would your do you agree that there is no universal definition of family. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it depends on how how much we want to get into the semantics of it. Um, mm-hmm. But but essentially, a, a family. I think most people would still associate or understand the term of what a family is, and that is about you know that that collective connection uh, and the biological aspect to it. So I think they would get it from a a purely academic or intellectual perspective, but I think most people would also understand that the dynamic of family has changed. And so whether it be in regards to, you know, the biological aspects and surrogacy and all all of those, you know, avenues of... of, um, what a family is and how a family is created um, mm-hmm. is definitely very diverse. And what would your definition of family be? Yeah, I've never, I've never actually looked it up, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like the actual term family. But yep. I would say that my definition of of family is is a is a is a group of people. Even if it's only one or two people uh, that you're connected with, that you're supported by, and that there's a level of trust 
in that relationship. So it is obviously a relationship that is on a higher level than any sort of transaction or business type partnership. It goes to a deeper level where even if it's not necessarily blood related, but if you see yourself as family, that you see a greater level of connection with that person. I love I love that definition. I think it's always it's always interesting hearing different guests talk about their definition of family, which is why for me, I arguably added it to my to every single show just to know because I know everyone. Yeah, it's sort of a universal question for me to ask every guest, um, just in terms of seeing how they feel about the word family. And and not every guest expects it and not every guest looks it up beforehand. So I love when they're unprepared and I just throw them that question. (laughs) I've never been asked that before. And it's, um, yeah, it is a good question. I've never, I, I don't even know with what I said, whether it makes sense, but that's what was coming up for me in the moment. Yes, no, it definitely makes sense. And I I think a lot of guests, a few guests have actually said the same thing in terms of it being a connection. Um, The guests I had previously to this recording had the same thing. And it was, it's very interesting. I love that particular definition because I don't think there is, whether blood related or not, I don't think family is blood related or not. So I definitely agree with that. Um, so what do you think the position of a family holds in today's society in particular? Well, it's, it's, it's extremely important and powerful. Um, we, we know even from, from past centuries that uh, empires have collapsed when families have disintegrated, uh, when, when the family structure isn't strong. Uh, that that um, societies and communities have also been fractured. So when we see, even like when we think in Australia, some of the community uh, communities that are strong together and essentially have an over sort of an overlapping level of family orientation. So it's not that they're you know um, meeting with each each and every one every night or connecting on that level, but there is a, a different level of communication and compassion and uh, a spirit of altruism where people are genuinely helping each other, even within a community, based on the fact that they see uh, their neighbours and their friends, their colleagues, uh, uh, even their the business owners, they see them as a slightly interconnected family, um, that that's where I think it's quite powerful. And you do see that in some of the smaller rural communities, where they do see that hey, we've got to we've got to work together. Uh, and it, it's like when you go to Tasmania. I've got to go to Tasmania next week, and I, I always think of Tasmanians uh, who I think are quite proud of that reputation, uh, where they say that you know if you've lived in Tasmania for maybe 20 years, you might be seen as a local. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, like, I don't know whether it's changed over recent years, but but, uh, just even from friends that have lived in Tasmania, uh, I remember one in particular, he stayed with us a couple of weeks ago. They were in Tasmania for, I think, close to 10 years, but they still were a local. (laughs) Um, So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's just that overlap that when community um, brings people in and sees them as a family, uh, it really does have a, a very powerful impact on how the community support mechanisms uh, can can be really strong in helping each other during difficult times and natural disasters. Mm-hmm. And why is it important for us to address family trauma amongst a natural disaster situation? It would be because of the, the flow-on effects. So with any natural disaster, um, when we think of that as being associated with trauma, it is going to have um, a lasting effect uh, because it's in people's memories. Uh, it's also a lot of there's there's a lot of discussion about how that also translates into our body and how we remember that and how it resurfaces um, 
in in our communication, in our emotional regulation, and and how we just manage it, even in you know our own being. So the the um, the importance of dealing with um, natural disasters and the trauma that's associated with it is incredibly important because if we don't, we will see that ripple effect potentially carry on for years. No, I think, especially when we're talking about natural disasters and I had never knew that there was really a family aspect to even consider when looking at the aftermath of a natural disaster, you th- look at the physical effects that it takes place and sometimes the emotional in terms of property damage and things like that, but never a family sense of how it would affect family members as a, as a whole. So what are some of the common reactions to trauma that can result from a natural disaster? It would be, uh, their sense of loss would be a major challenge that people face. And I was actually just talking to a colleague um, this morning and I was mentioning to her that I was going on this podcast about um, natural disasters and the family impact. And I said, I don't know why I'm doing it because I haven't really had that much experience with natural disasters, like counseling clients. And as we talked, uh, because I said, oh, you'd be good. I said, I need to recommend you, Sophie. Uh, because you would be good in this space uh, because of some of the bushfires and things of that nature. And we both sort of discussed the fact that um, the reality is that there probably is, with a lot of the clients that we deal with, uh, some trauma or flow-on effect that they are experiencing, even though we may not necessarily have identified it. And one thing it has um, sort of enlightened me to is maybe to investigate that a little bit further with clients, because sometimes we, uh, when we're meeting with clients, we're obviously not in the throes of a natural disaster, and so that isn't the presenting issue coming to us, but maybe that's an area that we need to delve in and be a little bit more curious about to see whether that is still having a flow on effect because when we think of the bushfires and the floods particularly um, in our local communities in New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria, the the flow on effect of those natural disasters and the sense of loss, whether it be uh, material things that have a really strong sentimental value and how people are dealing with that, um, but also uh, whether there's been injury that's occurred from a natural disaster, uh, and also family loss. So in the worst case scenario, of course, it's the grief and loss with the death of a loved one um, with a disaster. Um, and that again goes into a, a, you know, a very um, in-depth way that you would deal with that type of situation. But, but it could also be a dislocation. So due to a natural disaster, you needing to be geographically moved to a different location. And so then that having a flow on effect, particularly in the disability sector, where people are very reliant on the support networks and not just from their immediate family, but also the support network that they have around them and the trust and the rapport that they've developed, even with service providers, where now they're in with a totally new cohort of, of um, supports and then needing to build that trust. So the, the experiences of trauma for them would be very different to, to others. And how does the aftermath, the sort of the emotional trauma, how does that affect each individual family member's relationship to each other? But what, yeah, it's a good question. It would be, it would be very, um, it would be very individual, uh, you know, based on their ability to be resilient and to to manage their own um, you know, emotional turbulence that they've experienced. Um, but the and I think I think 
the, the, the key there is not having a one-size-fits-all approach and really understanding that for every individual, it is going to be different. And it's about hearing their story and and putting aside our judgments as to what uh, they should or shouldn't be doing or feeling or not feeling. Um, and, and understanding that even as therapists, that we need to be careful of is that we may see a client that's had a horrific um, experience and we've processed that, we've gone through that and supported that person. Then we meet with somebody else that on that level would be a two compared to an eight. Um, But for that person, it, it may be feeling like an eight. And so as therapists, we need to be really conscious of not um, not 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 judging or comparing. Not that we would do it explicitly, but maybe inadvertently, we would be coming in and thinking, "Well, um, your situation is not really that bad, you know, compared to other clients that we've just dealt with." So I think coming into that space and really allowing the clients to be heard, regardless of what their situation is. So. How does experiencing a natural disaster impact family relationships and also their dynamics of how they would work? It it probably similar to the comments a moment ago that it it would be impacting, um, for instance, mum and dad very differently to children. like it's interesting when you ask that question for children they their level of ignorance um, can be a protective factor so for instance you know they might be experiencing a flood and the house is getting ruined and they're needing to evacuate uh, but the children might be seeing it as an adventure and and knowing that oh there's a pool of water out there we never see water of this nature and just wanting to have fun. So the, the interpretation is definitely um, something that can affect one person very differently to another. Uh, and also the pragmatic nature of, a, of and again, I'm, I'm gender stereotyping a little here, but for a man who may be just so focused on the pragmatics and just needing to do this, this and this, and not really thinking about the emotional um, flow on effect for his 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 partner or um, or his children, and just wanting to get the safety element looked after, and also the practicalities of property and so forth. So, I think the the challenge there is once you do get to work with the family, is to process uh, what their experience was, what their interpretation of that experience was. Uh, but also what they noticed in their family that they've never necessarily had the opportunity to sit down and reflect on. So, I, I, and I find this in, in a lot of aspects of our work, uh, it's very important not just to look at the experience, but to also ask the question, what did you notice was the impact on your partner? Or what did you notice was the impact on your children? And for some people, they may never have actually noticed, like consciously noticed the impact. And so sitting in that space is a really good opportunity to give them the opportunity to be able to genuinely, compassionately and empathically think about, oh, okay, well, I never realized that this was potentially what was going on for them. And, to, and allow them to hear that. So if you're working with a family or you're working with a couple and allowing that person to share uh, their experience and, and the difference uh, and the nuanced difference that they, they reflect on compared to another person can be really important in uh, like maintaining or reestablishing a connection between the family so that they understand that even though potentially, I, and I know I'm sort of waffling on a little bit here with this uh, response, but potentially with regards to uh, the 
and I'm just, again, generalizing a little, but with the man being very pragmatic and him discounting the emotional trauma or the emotional effect on family members just purely to get through the through the challenges, for him then to have had the opportunity to genuinely hear what was going on for other family members can be quite insightful where they then start to appreciate that it's not just a matter of getting over it and and even being really careful of their language because their language might be very much that dialogue of, you know, I'm okay. You know, you should be okay. We just have to move on and and forgetting that uh, there is a, a different way that people process those experiences and um, and allowing them to to hear uh, from family mem- from other family members that that um, are, are processing it very differently. And so, in, in terms of some of the steps that families can do in order to emotionally, I think, also open up about the particular um, fears that they may have had to force themselves to overcome. What are some of the steps that families can take to begin that process? We're definitely even just asking for support, asking for help, putting their hand up and saying that they would be willing and open to having a discussion. And ideally, that might be just initially with the family, because that's all that they feel safe to do it with. Um, But if they do then venture into the space where they could have a third party, whether it be a therapist or some professional, that, that there's a level of trust that's built so that they're able to sit in that space. I think that's really important for um, the family to initiate some process. So whether it be that they're going to manage it, maybe even if there's only one family member that is willing to maybe get some outside um, feedback so that they could then bring it into the family dynamic, uh, at least that's a starting point just to get the conversation happening and really view it as an opportunity to have some open dialogue and for particularly for children, um, but also and again, I'm gender stereotyping a little bit for the man who may not necessarily want to, you know, go into the whole processing side of it, to just understand that this is a way of them showing that they care, that they're willing to take that little bit of time out to sit down and just listen to what was going on for others within the family. Not about putting aside, not not putting across um, opinions or judgments or even practicalities. And again, for men, we're notorious for wanting to come up with a solution and saying, well, no, this is what you need to do and this is what I did. Um, Avoiding that uh, and just really um, allowing space for people to be heard. I think it's especially when it comes to the different ways that each family member goes through things. For me, like I've never experienced it myself and I've never seen it happen firsthand. But with that process, it must be such a lengthy discussion that can take place amongst the family members. How can you get children to sort of see that what they, what was experienced wasn't something that should be, for lack of a better term, romanticized? Yes. Um, well, I suppose for children, for them to understand that uh, if they did see it as a playful experience where they didn't really understand the impact because mum and dad may have done an incredibly good job of protecting them, um, using language that didn't escalate their emotions, that played it down. So mum and dad may have done it. You know, and the support network may have done an incredible job of managing that to the point that the children just don't really like consciously or intellectually understand what was going on. Um, so it is a good point that you mentioned not to romanticize it as, oh, that was such fun or that was such an adventure. 
um, but also understanding that that there is a flow on effect, and maybe in in an age appropriate manner, depending on where the children are at, being able to have that conversation at the appropriate time to help them to appreciate that there, there was a flow on effect, whether it be financially, emotionally, um, that that mum and dad or other people within the family, aunties, uncles, grandparents, other siblings, maybe that didn't cope with it as well, uh, did see it in a very different way. And that's why it's very difficult for them. And that's why they're, they're not coping. That's why they've needed to get some additional help or that they're acting out or behaving in a way that we're not condoning, but we're, we're understanding a little better than getting children to understand that. And I think a really important point on that, if I could just tap into one aspect that can be really helpful is um, whether it be children or adults, getting them to understand uh, that when they went through that natural disaster, remembering back to a point where they felt safe. So therapeutically, when they, it's just a process from a trauma-informed perspective, is getting that client to really understand and to sit back into that space where they went through the difficult patch and they reached a point where they can remember feeling safe. And then anchoring that feeling and maybe even ramping it up so that they truly can lock that into their memory so that it can be something that they can draw on as an anchor that when they do have the trauma sort of resurfacing, that they can remember back to the point of safety so that that way that becomes the anchor that they can pull into when they need to. And that can be really helpful both for children and for to mum and dad when you're, when you're processing it with the clients so that they do have a tool uh, and a memory that they can link back into very quickly and easily. So it sort of becomes, the trauma sort of becomes a momentary situation rather than something that they're fixated on, for example. Yes. Yeah, and it may not necessarily be momentary, um, like the trauma, because that may have even lasted for some time. And, and even when we think of the floods and the bushfires, um, people might be sitting in that, that space of trauma literally for months. So, But it'll be at different levels. So it might be initially just at that state of like evacuating and then the, the um, just a turmoil of getting out of the situation. But then it's the flow on effect um, of managing everything else that's going on. I think of like Lismore, and the cleanup uh, efforts that they had to go through, which went on for months. So, so really for them to process their trauma, it would be after they've got all of that done. Like, and not that you would necessarily do it that way, but sometimes getting access to those people, you wouldn't be able to see them until they were in a place where they could say, yeah, I'm happy to sit down now and talk because they were so focused on just doing what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, but... But in that, whether it be a day, a month, a week, whatever period it is, that if they can associate back to a period where they did get a relief or they got some level of generosity, it, it could even just be in the middle of the trauma or the middle of the disaster where somebody showed um, a, a, a really generous act and, and looked after them for a night and they they delivered a meal and, and and a warm blanket and they had a beautiful night's sleep and being able to remember that experience where they felt safe, they felt nurtured, they felt cared for and then helping them to realize that, okay, well, I want you to, I want you to remember that experience and anchor back into it when you do start to have those other memories that are escalating and really putting you in a in a really challenging and uncomfortable space so that mm -hmm. that way it becomes a little coping mechanism tool that they can tap into. Okay, well, it's, it sounds 
Is that very similar to what the ideology of is of um, learned optimism, for example? Like, how does learned optimism fit into dealing with grief and loss after a disaster? Yeah, so like Martin Seligman, uh, who I think even coined that phrase of learned help, like learned optimism, uh, talks a lot about the need to develop um, a, a more optimistic sort of personality and how it can be developed. Um, and he has an acronym called PERMA. Can't remember all the, but basically it goes into the steps of or, or the components of what learned optimism is and how incredibly important it is for us to uh, develop that skill set before and before a disaster. Because we've all heard that catchphrase that the worst time to prepare for a disaster is when you're in one. Um, so similar principle with our ability to focus on the positive is, is it's a trait that we acquire with discipline because there are so many influences that will naturally gravitate towards a negative response and our, our brains are wired that way to look for the negative because the brain's primary purpose in life is to keep us alive. And so from a survival point of view, it's always looking for the dangers. And it's that radar that becomes very good at looking for the problems. And so when we allow our brain uh, and our mind to steer us in that direction, and it becomes such a strong pattern, it does take away sometimes that natural ability that we need to discipline ourselves to steer towards, well, what's working? What, what's actually working well? Um, what is something that I can be grateful for? And that discipline of even being grateful for something that occurred today is a process that is incorporated with learned optimism that helps us to be able to, to sleep at night knowing that there was something that I'm, I'm grateful for, that I appreciate that occurred today. And, and if we have the opportunity to actually share that with people, because then that reinforces it, not only for ourselves, but also for others. Uh, you know, if, if somebody did a nice deed um, or somebody said a beautiful word of commendation, to be able to share that with somebody else, again, just has that, that dual impact of not only helping us, helping somebody else, but it reinforces for us that we do have a lot to appreciate. And that's connected very strongly to um, being positive in our outlook, not being Pollyanna out positive, like just thinking everything's going to be rosy, um, but, but practically um, being optimistic. And this fits in really nicely with the next section, which is the practice and habit. What are some effective strategies for coping and healing that you practiced after natural disasters that impact your family? Well, one thing, I mean, there's, there's so many different approaches and strategies, but one thing or a few things that have helped is having that ability to look forward to something. Um, and that ability to know that things are going to change. And, and there's a, a, a very um, sort of pithy saying uh, that goes something like, how do you make a how do you make a sad person happy and a happy person sad? You tell them that this feeling is not going to last. And the reality, even that's even though that's very simplistic, the reality is is that the emotions that we are going through aren't going to be permanent. And so if we can reassure and comfort people to help them to understand that uh, that what they are experiencing in the moment, as challenging as it is, isn't going to last. Uh, and giving them something to look forward to. So sometimes just planting a seed or asking a question about and, and understanding and delving into what it is that uh, is their juice in life or, or their motivation in life, um, but having that conversation 
So being interested in the person in a really genuine way so that you can tap into that. It might just be about a footy game, like that they're looking forward to the Parramatta Eagles winning a grand final, which is, just continues to elude them. Um, mm-hmm. But but just being able to uh, look forward to a, a nice meal, like their favourite meal that they have or something that will just take them out of that space, that mental space at the moment and look forward to something that they really enjoyed and that gives them that lift. Uh, and that was like Victor Frankl, you know, the, everyone knows about his Man Search for Meaning book that really tapped into his ability to be able to get through the Holocaust was his ability to look forward to what he was going to do with his family. And even though his wife died in, in the Holocaust, the fact that he actually consciously disciplined himself to look forward to those experiences is what helped him to survive. And mm-hmm. similar to, for us with any sort of natural disaster, to be able to project forward and to have something that we are looking forward to doing. So are there any challenges that can occur when you go through the practice? Definitely the need to be conscious of working together as a team whilst also striking the balance of taking the initiative. And so what we mean by that is uh, if you've created uh, cohesion within your team where you are um, connecting and you're communicating and you're aware of what is happening within your team, uh, particularly as a family supporting each other, but also um, taking the initiative. So if you see a situation that does require some additional attention, not to feel like you have to wait, uh, but definitely take the initiative and, and do what do what's needed. But when we say about striking the balance, it's also keeping the team informed so that you're not going off on a tangent where the form the team isn't aware of certain things that that um, that are occurring. And an example of that is when we think of like a football team going out onto a um, onto a game, they will always run the play before the game. So they'll discuss it, they'll analyze it, they'll strategize so that everybody is in the loop on that play. Then when they go out on the on the field, they're not surprised at the play. They, they work in harmony with it. And they obviously have to adapt and be flexible to the circumstances, but at least they're on the same page. Similar to the family situation, or even if we're working together with other counsellors or therapists in a natural disaster, is working together and keeping those individual teams in the loop as to what we are maybe necessarily doing uh, on an individual basis and keeping them aware. And that might just be literally that our uh, team, just so you're aware, I had to have a little chat with Susie. Um, there's a situation that's just surfaced, we dealt with it, and then they're informed. So not mm-hmm. necessarily going into all the detail, but just so that people then are a little bit more tolerable, a bit more patient and understanding as to why maybe some behaviours are occurring with Susie and why she's acting out that way. So. It's really important just to keep that communication flowing so that people don't even perceive us um, as, uh, you know, the, the, the individual trying to do their own, um, sort of doing their own work and, and being the hero on the side. Um, it, particularly in disaster situations, it's not about trying to get um, opportunities for self accolades or or um, uh, recognition it, it's really the opportunity to uh, view it as as a means of helping people without you getting any recognition and I think as human beings we all love recognition we love commendation it's a it's a natural thing that we have in us to want to be recognized for what we've done but but in these situations, in the true sense of being altruistic, it is 
be willing to do things without any recognition. So you may you may work ten times harder than somebody else. They might get some accolade or some commendation. You may not get anything, and you're not bothered by that because your purpose is about helping people or getting people through those situations. And mm -hmm. and it's the the value um, and the gratitude that you get from knowing that what you've done is for that purpose. And when you have that expectation, you're much more open to to having uh, that approach because you're not waiting or expecting uh, any recognition externally. You're doing it internally. Mm -hmm. And this would be a practice that you would recommend to everyone to sort of go through when dealing with a, when facing a natural disaster or in the aftermath of it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It, it's uh, one of the things that we learned in this particular training program that surprised me a little was that they recommended, and the research backed it up, that pragmatically, when we are helping in a natural disaster, the best value that we're going to get is when we get uh, when we get as many people collectively in a group and work with them as a group, not individually, which um, it probably shouldn't have surprised me because uh, I, I love group work anyway, but but they, they really recommended that when you are doing the work uh, and you're sitting and you're processing and you're, um, you know, you, you're supporting in whatever mechanism you have available, to try to get as many people into that environment at that time, rather than say, oh, look, come over, I'll work with you, I'll work with you, I'll work with you, because the difficulty of that is the time element, um, but also by putting them in that collective little group, even a group that they may not even necessarily know, it creates that additional mechanism of support once you leave. Mm -hmm. So they can support each other. And, that, and and again, it sort of goes back to the systemic family sort of approach that if you can build the family up, uh, that they will support each other and not be so reliant on you as a therapist or any other external support, that that's going to be, from a longevity perspective, far more beneficial for these for these families and these communities and these small groups that um, that need to get through the tough times. Um, so the next section that we like to introduce is the open mic section. In the last minute or so, we'd love for you to have the floor in order to share something that you are passionate about or something that you would love to introduce to the audience. And you can even self-promote for sure. There is also that room to do so. So if there's anything that you would like to share with the audience, uh, just in the minute, last minute or so, we'd love to for you to have the, the time to. Wow, I should have thought about that question. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, something that I, like, I'm really passionate about is... It is just like getting families, getting individuals and couples, uh, allowing more space for open dialogue and fun in their relationships and looking for opportunities where they can incorporate both. That it doesn't always have to be, you know, incredibly serious, but using humor, laughter, playfulness, uh, in the process of what what work they might be doing on themselves, and and just being really open and honest, um, and and humble, in the sense of knowing that we don't have the answers, and if we can come into this space knowing that I don't have the answers, and even for us as therapists and as group leaders, uh, it's one of the things that I always sort of echo really strongly at the beginning of any program is that, like, I don't have the answers, um, you know, and 
and in a group setting as well, that as facilitators, we don't have the answers, but we, we want to explore together. We want to do this together. We're going to walk together through this journey and discover some strategies and approaches that are going to be uh, adaptable to your circumstance and to your personality um, so that it really fits well for you. And it's not just about a prescription and saying, well, here's a medicine that you need and that'll work. It's more about exploring what is going to um, be most effective and enjoyable, maintaining that joy uh, amongst the turmoil, which essentially is what joy, the difference between joy and happiness, like happiness and pleasure seeking is momentary, but joy can be maintained even amongst the difficulties. And so when we have distress and we have turmoil, that we can still be joyful because that's a mindset that we have regardless of our circumstances. It's not dictated by geography or finances or um, or other um, um, yeah, individual uh, situations that pop up, but rather it's the mindset of knowing that I can work through these challenges uh, regardless of, of what is going to be thrown at me. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an amazing way to end the show. I think that is an amazing piece of advice that we could share. And I could definitely see the sun <laughs> Coming turning through. up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the perfect timing. And I want to thank you for joining me on the show today, Michael, and just coming on and talking about natural disasters and the effect that it has on families, especially the aftermath, which is something that we don't usually see and we don't usually talk about. Um, so it is amazing to have you on the show and to have you talking about it today. Um, if there is any way that audience member would like to get in contact with you to discuss this more or to talk even to book a session and uh, talk to you personally, is there a way that they're able to? Uh, yes, definitely. I've got a website, but I <laughs> very rarely have a look, like check it. But um, yeah, probably my LinkedIn profile is probably the easiest. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and the things that I love to, to help with obviously is the individual couples counselling. But um, I, yeah, I've been doing a bit of work in the space of um, workshops, doing workshops for different organisations in emotional intelligence, and also on just managing emotions. Um, we recently did a, a workshop for carers, um, and. Uh, just helping them to manage their emotions in difficult and distressing circumstances um, in their role as carers. Um, and those sort of workshops, um, uh, yeah, I love, love sort of that type of work uh, because it's also adaptable uh, in the workplace, working with different organizations that I've worked with, helping them to improve their emotional well-being in the workplace so that they can um, collaborate better, communicate better, and and work more cooperatively as a team. No, I I love talking about aging family, and I think I speak about it quite often on the show. Uh, so, carers and ho the whole ideology around their mental health is also important to me, and I love hearing about it. Yeah. Um, so that's a great that there is workshops available in Australia for that is run by professionals such as yourself to talk a little bit more about it. Um, so thank you so much again, Michael, for joining me and for talking about the topic today. And yes, I definitely hope that you guys enjoyed the episode. Um, I'll leave the information to Michael's website and his LinkedIn profile down below uh, if you wish to get into contact with him. So yeah, thank you guys so much for listening and I will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you, Dina, for the pleasure of speaking with you today and your listeners. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> You've been listening to All Together, the Family Science Insights podcast, produced by Family Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. 
More of our work can be found on our website at fa.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent, and thanks for tuning in.